episode 18 of our podcast mm -hmm. and part two uh, dealing with the story of Ayana and her descent into darkness and mm -hmm. uh, I believe this way uh, this week we'll be finishing up we'll be finishing up yep you're right because you know you made a comment last time Doug oh my god you're gonna leave us at the bottom of hell <laughs> So we're going to wander around hell for a bit and then come back up. Yes, okay. yes. As Shadow is wont to do, it's going to wander around hell. <clears throat> so just as a, a very quick recap, we have the goddess Inanna. And this is a Sumerian tale. And Inanna is the queen of heaven and she's the queen of earth. And she has a sister named Urshkigil. Urshkigil is the goddess of... Kerr, or the netherworld, or is what we refer to now as the underworld or the lower world. And we went through some of the trials and tribulations of Inanna as she was growing up. We learned that she had auspicious aunts, uncles, fathers, and sisters. And we know that Inanna had a penchant for being a bit petulant. And she was a trickster and gained wisdom for her people by using alcohol as a tricking agent for her grandfather Enki, who was the god of wisdom and water. And we learnt that she put upon the seven robes of humanity or the seven aspects of humanity. And we went through what they were and so just to remind ourselves of the layers or the pieces that she took off, she took off the crown that she wore on top of her head, which was the crown that indicated that she was the queen of the people, or it was the, the, the people. The crown also represented and represents the psyche of the self, the awareness of the self, the lightened and enlightened aspect of self. The second part that we talked about in the adornment was a lapis lazuli necklace and the necklace talking about, I think the oftentimes when we watch whether it is a king or a queen being brought into something that is holy, they're often given some sort of necklace or some sort of chain to represent the relationship however that relationship is represented. So she took off the lapis lazuli. The third uh, parts of herself that she removed were the wonderful jewels that she had placed upon her breasts, and those were the third. And then the fourth that she released was the breastplate, and I think that is that protected self, that is that part of protection. So if we come to the throat, that's our that's our heart, that's our throat chakra, this is our communication. Lapis lazuli can also often be associated with the sixth, seventh chakras. So we know that when we took off the crown, when we've taken off the head, we literally are removing the conscious self. So the conscious, the constraints of the conscious self are being removed. When they, we remove the jewels from the breasts and the plate from around the belly, we are now exposing in the psyche of ourself that which is a female, that which sustains life, which is the breasts, even if it's just from a metaphorical perspective. And we have covered that which is the most vulnerable part of ourself. So that vulnerability, we've now given away that vulnerability, the protection of the core of who we are. The ring or the bracelet was the next thing that Inanna released as the gates closed behind her. And oftentimes these are associated with action. So now the psyche, the psyche now has no ability to act in this manner. Instead, the psyche now must submit to this. And also in each of the stairs, Inanna was told by every single gatekeeper 
you are not allowed to question what goes on. These are the rules of Kerr and you can and you must obey them. So she couldn't even say, don't take my crown. What are you doing with my jewels? Because she was not allowed to question. And I think that refers to that aspect of our psyche when we become really afraid of descending into ourselves. Or how about this analogy? You're really you you really know that lake is going to be absolutely freezing cold but you're you're tempted and you really really want to jump in that lake even though you know it's not going to be really good for you so you just you're not allowing yourself to talk yourself out of it and you just you run all helter skelter to the end of the dock and you just dive in the water and you go <gasps> and that's kind of what this is like so it is that reminder that the psyche has no ability to to allow any kind of question you can't question this. And then the, la the sixth gift that she gives is that lapis lazuli measuring rod and the line. And in later myths, it talks about it being her staff. When I first encountered the, the measuring rod and the line, because I really love using pendulums and, and I have worked with dowsing for a good number of years, the first thing I thought was, holy crap, she's got a dowsing rod and she has a pendulum. That's really funky. However, I think that is truly just my own imagination. I don't believe that is the case. When I was able to find some of the esoteric thoughts behind what this would be in the Sumerian culture, and in many of the cultures around Mesopotamia, they would use measuring rods. And we talked about that. And we talked about the fact that Inanna was the judge of life and she was the bringer of life. And as a result, she would have that measuring rod of how long your life was. In another story called La Calavera, which is a, quite a similar story in some regards to this one, for La Calavera, when she finally brings her apprentice down to the place of souls, each soul has a different type of candle. So some candles are really tall and some candles are really short. I believe that is likely a similar symbolism. So again, we're talking about that mythology, mythology transfer or that transitional mythology. And I do think that line is that connection between the soul, between the, the self and that connection to the divine. Because when we travel into the darkness, it's really important to remember we have some sort of connection to the divine, that we're not going to be in essence or uh, perhaps not fully abandoned by the light of the universe. And then the last gift that she gives away is that which represents her, that which truly identifies her as royalty, which is her lady robes or her robe. And that's the last thing. So the last, the seventh door slams behind her and she is in front of her sister Urshkigil and she is completely naked. She is completely vulnerable. When we find ourselves into the descent of our shadow and whether that is a, a crippling depression or whether that is a self-exploration to find the roots of the trauma which causes you to have X, Y, Z types of behaviors. And so from that regard, from that regard, we have um, the ability of the soul to take things into course or to take things into assessment. She stands up and Nana stands up and then her sister is starting to have pains and one of the first lines that I noticed that really struck me was Urshkigil assigned her sister the eyes of death. So Urshkigil looked at her in a withering manner that would bring about death. And I read in the same version of that story when Inanna ascends later in this part of the podcast, she also uses the eyes of death upon somebody which I don't believe that the queen of heaven and earth would have had the eyes of death if she hadn't descended to death. So I believe the lessons that we have encountered in the Kerr, in that netherworld, in the underworld of self, 
they change us. They change us and make us less afraid of the part of ourselves that can be give a withering glance of death or who can wish death upon a relationship, whether that relationship is to human being, to an animal or to food or to whatever that relationship is. So I found that to be an interesting notation in one of the, in one of the variations that I read. And so her sister starts to walk up to her and she wants to take over the the actual, the absolute throne of the underworld. She wants to be the queen of the heavens. She wants to be queen of the world and she wants to be queen of the underworld. Now, mind you, remember, she had a tiny bit of a hand in killing Urshkigil's husband. And so Urshkigil has no love for her sister and they already don't have any love anyway. And so what Urshkigil does was she flicks her hand and she kills Inanna. And then she takes her body naked and hangs it on a hook. So here we have upside down. So here we have the very first written account of crucifixion. We also have a representation of hanging upside down. In one of the uh, interpretations of the story, the Hebrew word more for the hook literally means a place between the worlds. So when Urshkigil hung her upon this hook, she was hung upon the place between the worlds and she was hung by her feet. And she was to stay there. Like remember when she talked to Nishabur, she said, you must wait three days and three nights. And we've seen that transition of the story, that, tri that, that transitory myth, not only in the mythology of Christ, we also have it in the mythology of Osiris, we have other where we have come descended into the darkness for three. But again, we look at that part of numerology. The three is the one of the most perfect numbers because it is the number of creation. We have zero, which is nothing. We have one, which is a singular. We have two, which is the duality. The marriage between the one and the two creates a three and in essence creates something outside of themselves. So three days and three nights really means that gestational part of the soul to birth something outside of itself. So this is where we have the number three coming into play. And Urshkigil, during this time, she starts to go through horrible pains and horrible body. The way that I look at it is you, how can, she knows she has killed her sister. She knows she has killed her other self. It, she knows, the shadow knows it has killed its connection to the light. So it's going to have to now go through a birthing process. The body has to hurt. It's a wounding of self. And in the oldest of the old myths, they talk about her having to have birthing pains. And she's uh, naked except for another lapis lazuli pendant. And she is laying upon a lapis lazuli slab. That, that, those, I don't know what that means to the Sumerians. I don't know why those were important details, but I find them fascinating details. And from this part, Urshkigil has defeated her sister and Inanna is dead and she starts to stink and she becomes a rotting piece of meat. After three days, Ninshabar is, she is beside herself. Remember, she is that part of ourself. She's that inner spiritual self. So when we descend into the, into the lower world, when we descend into the Kur, when we descend into the deep psyche of ourself, there is always that conscious part of ourself that is forever walking back and forth from the gates of the underworld that is trying to keep us alive, which is why when Enki sent the demons, Ninshubur was the one who protected Inanna and killed the six demons once she got the, you know, the May, the, the, the 100 gifts from Enki to give wisdom to her people. So the conscious self, the, 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 the innermost psyche is the one that defends itself from the demons and resurrects itself from the demons. It's that upper part of us, you know, that the head part, the conscious part, the awakened psyche that wants the wisdom, but doesn't know really how to defend itself because it doesn't really live in the body, so to speak, right? So Ninshabur, she does exactly what 
uh, you know, Ursh could, what Inanna has asked her to do. Inanna has asked her to cut her mouth. Inanna has asked her to cut her skin. Inanna has asked her to pull her hair and to rip her clothes and to wear sacks on their body. And those are really common practices for grief. Those are common practices in many cultures. We still have that relationship to grief. We still have that relationship to loss. We've lost that in Canada. Even if we sit for Shiva, that is even looked at strange if you're not of the culture that sits Shiva. So we don't really have a lot of death rituals. So when our psyche comes to that place of death, when our soul comes to that place of dying to its own self, we have to really hope that we have an inner spiritual self that will ring the alarm. Wake up body, wake up body, wake up body. So in that fact, Ninshaber, she starts to beat on the drum and she starts to beat on, on, the, on the tambourine and she's wailing and she goes to the seven temples and Inanna had seven temples and before she descended into the Kur, she closed off and took her took her godliness, so to speak, from all of the seven temples. And that's a symbol of withdrawing ourselves from the world so that we can actually descend into the underworld to shut off the aspects of ourselves that we, we, we have to take with us. We can't leave it up there because we actually have to deal with these things. So she went to the priests and the priestesses for the seven temples and she woke them up. She went to her sons because Inanna and her husband Demuzi had two sons and she went to the sons and the sons did the same thing, tore their clothes, cut their mouths, cut their arms, pulled their hair and wore sacks. All of the holy people within the temples did the exact same thing. And Ninshabar, she's that consciousness. She's the consciousness uh, uh, that has been raised. She's the model of the of a human's deepest reflective of the self. So that you know that ear of the threatened self. So the the first place that she goes is to her paternal grandfather, who is Enlil, the god of air. And the god of air tells her, this is what she deserved. What did I, Nana, expect? She descended into the underworld. This is exactly what she deserved. So I'm not helping her. Then Ninshubur went to Nana, the god of the moon, who is the father of Ainana, and said, please, your, your, your daughter is down in the netherworld. She really needs your help. She really needs to come out. And again, he says, you, she got what she deserves. The rules of the underworld cannot be broken. And eventually she goes to Enki. And Enki is the god of wisdom. So you have to have, yeah, I believe that Enki would have to have a certain amount of respect for, hey, you know, you went on a really funky journey. You went on a long journey of self-discovery. And I'm actually quite curious to find out how it turned out because no one has ever emerged from Kerr alive. So I will help you. And he wants to gain the wisdom. And he, that is the wisdom path, right? It's the, going into the self and deeping into yourself is a path of wisdom. So when she goes to Enki, Enki is quite the interesting character and what Enki decides that she die, that he can do is that um, he could make something for her and so he took dirt from under his fingernails and he created the, I want to get this right, so he created what were called um, well, asexual beings, he, the, the names of them are Kurgara and Galator. So this is what he creates underneath from the dirt underneath his fingernails of two beings. They're instinctual. They are asexual creatures and they are capable of mirroring the lonely queen's emotions. So in essence, they're professional mourners. That's what these two beings are. So they are humble, non-heroic creatures. They, without definition, or even, they don't even need the, to, to, be, to be separately defined. So they have no ego needs. And these little asexual creatures 
really truly represent the attitude necessary to draw a blessing from the dark goddess. So to come in humble without ego. So Enki instructs him, his creations on how to enter the Kerr and how to deal with Urshkigo. And he tells them how to recover Inanna from death. So when Kugura and Galafor arrive, and they slide through like flies in between the rocks, and that's how they get down into the underworld. So they are completely unseen by the gatekeepers of the seven gates to be able to descend into hell. And she is, Urshkigil is crying. She's a woman about to give birth. And so she complains about her inside and her outside. So she says, oh, my insides. And these two creatures go, oh, your insides. And she goes, oh, my outsides. And oh, my your outsides. Oh, I am so pained. Oh, you are so pained. And this is the first time that Urshkigil, or the shadow side, had ever received kindness or compassion or even understood what it was. And Urshkigil, the coldest of the cold, the deadest of the dead, has the willingness and the desire to reward them. She even at one point, she says, I will make you individual creatures. In essence, what she's saying is that she will take away their non-egoic state and their asexual state, and she will make them complete beings. What a temptation to the psyche. What a temptation to that that rescues us. We don't actually have to be rescued. Wait a minute, there's something else that I can have. So very, very trickster-like, very, very crafty. But because these two were created in the manner that they were, they denied and said no to all of her offers of gifts. And she said, well, what can I give you? And they said, well, you can give us Ainana. Now what Enki had given them, they, she had given them the waters of life and the food of life. So what they did was they gave that to Ainana they revised or revived Ainana and they took her up to the upper world, but not without a great deal of stress because the, the gods of the underworld, the Kerr, they were there when Urshkigil killed her sister. And each of the seven of them, here's that repetitive number of wholeness and purity, right? They also said, no, you cannot. They immediately judged her and were immediately in place with her being killed. And they demanded to go with her because when you take something out, you have to put something back in. And it's the same as the shadow. So when we take something from the shadow up to the light, we have to bring a light aspect down to ourselves to enliven that or live in that part of ourselves. So they go up and the first thing that the these demons of the curse see is Ninshubur. And they say, oh, give us Ninshubur, give us Ninshubur. And Anana's like, are you nuts? This is my wisest counsel. See the sores on her lips. She's bleeding. Her hair is half done. She's in rags. No, she's genuinely mourning. So then they go to the to the, the holy people for the temples and they say, give us these. And she's like, no, no, you can't have these. They are obviously mourning. And so then her sons came and, oh, give us your sons. No, no, you can see they're totally mourning. Now, the part of the story I haven't talked about is Demuzi, which is her husband. And he was a human and he was a human being. And this human being is a mortal. So he represents that mortal part of ourself in the story. And when she finds him, she thinks, oh, he's going to be the most broken up. He will, he will have ripped out all of his hair. He will be so sad. Instead, what he is, is he doesn't really give a care that his wife is gone. He doesn't really give a care. He has adopted all the kingly robes. So we've made our mortal coil even more important. And he has now, in one of the stories, he already has concubines or he already has lovers at his side. And she fixes the eyes of death upon Demuzi. And she says, you must go to hell. So of course Demuzi runs and Demuzi gets caught six times. And on the seventh time, believe it or not, there's another number seven. On the seventh time, 
he says, okay, I'm going to go down into and take your place. Dumuzi has a sister, again, that masculine feminine counterpart of the consciousness right? The immortal consciousness says, I can't, I cannot live with you going away forever. And I cannot live with mother's grief to lose you. So she decides to take six months and Dumuzi decides to take six months. And that does satisfy Urshkigil, the queen of the underworld. Hence, we have the, you know, that balance, that duality, the coming together, the two parts. And Dumuzi was saved because his, because Ainana loved him. Inanna thought twice about sending him to hell for a whole year, for the rest of it, because she still longed for that husband that she loved. And when we have a relationship between the, 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 the godliness or that, the, the absolute psyche, Demuzi is the mortal. And if the heavenly or the divine is to reside in the middle world, the divine needs a human. So the metaphor, the avataric idea or the tantric idea is for the uplifting of humankind, a divine power using a spiritual vehicle descends into the human body. So that spiritual vehicle is Ainana. So it's, that is an aspect of what Dumuzi represents. And the end of the story comes about in that Dumuzi does recognize that there was no mourning, that the mortal self doesn't mourn what it really doesn't understand. And the story also is a great reminder of the ability of the psyche to rule the roost, so to speak. And in order for the psyche to descend into the darkness of self, it has to let go of what it identifies with. It has to be that non-egoic aspect. It has to remove itself from the temples of, of its own self in order to truly go deeply inside itself. The fact that my ancestors' ancestors wanted to develop this into a psyche story or develop this as a teaching tool in their oral traditions for the people that lived, you know, 3000 BC to 1500 BC, I think is really very incredibly advanced human psyche. And in the anthropology of consciousness, it is recognized that there was a very gradual and deepening of the relationship of the human to the divine, to the sacred, to the psyche. So it was in studying the anthropology of consciousness, what it took in order to get human beings to the place where they had the ability for introspection, that place of West on the medicine wheel. So that is the end of the story of Ainana, and that is the end of the story of the descent and the ascent of the soul according to the Sumerian myths. Very cool. Thank you, Doug. Uh, no questions from my end this time, but uh, mm -hmm. I think it, hopefully everyone enjoyed the story. I hope so, and I, and I hope it also gave them pause to reflect. And I hope, you know, one of the things I did when I was learning the story of Inanna was I used, you know, a stick figure and, and charts and I drew it out so that my conscious mind could really actually see what it was leaving behind. And in various versions of it, what I've left are words that are associated with the seven gifts. Mm -hmm. So for me, the crown would be my love of my intellect. And then the throat, what the throat for me in the beginning was finding my voice because I didn't actually believe I had a voice. And so various other aspects. So I would write beside it what it was that I was seeking, what it was that I was releasing in order to move deeper into my shamanic journeys. Mm. Yeah, it sounds like you don't, you could almost do a journey to each one of those points. Absolutely. On its own, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So Very food cool. for thought, food for thought. Very cool. I guess we'll kind of wrap up there. And, wrap up there. Uh, thank you, everyone, again for listening. We'll uh, have another podcast in a couple of weeks. And if you're enjoying this and uh, want to give us a thank you by going over to iTunes or whatever, uh, wherever you're listening to this from and leaving a comment and a rating, we highly appreciate it. Thank highly. You. Thank you.